Hello and welcome to Research Method Content Analysis. As part of your specification, you need to understand what content analysis is as a research method in its own right. In many ways, content analysis is actually very similar to an observation, except it's used in scenarios where you can't directly observe the behavior or you don't want to directly observe the behavior of individuals. Instead, you try to glean some uh, explanation of their behavior through the artifacts that they produce. A definition for content analysis is here. So what do we mean by artifacts? Well, artifacts in content analysis are anything that humans produce. It can be art, it can be newspapers, articles, journals, it could be books, TV shows, adverts, it could even be online artifacts such as Twitter posts and Facebook posts. So an example of content analysis that took place very recently. So in this study, Demos used an algorithm to look at 1.46 million posts on social media platform. They used a three week period which used the keywords in their search the words were chosen as a result of the 2014 study. Now this is a very sophisticated content analysis, but many can be carried out in a much simpler way. Essentially what you do is you take a series of Twitter profiles, uh, maybe at random, maybe you select high prof uh, profile celebrities, and you decide which post you're actually gonna look at. You don't have time necessarily to trawl through everyone's posts. So maybe you decide you're going to select one um, post from every page. This is assuming we don't use an algorithm. You develop the categories you're looking for. So they had clear categories in the study. They were keywords that they were looking for. And then you count the number of times they occur. This essentially gives you some kind of of um, idea of how frequently this behavior is occurring. And this is your content analysis. Sampling is key when you're carrying out content analysis. You select your medium, are we looking at TV shows, adverts, Facebook, Twitter, articles, books. Once you decide that, should you read the whole thing or should you actually select uh, a more systematic way of analyzing it? If you're looking at a book, should you pick every 10th word, 9th sentence, 12th page? This can be very important if the medium is particularly large, as in the case of Twitter. If comparing content, should mediums be selected randomly? This goes back to our, should we just randomly pick fiction books uh, from the library, uh, news articles? randomly selected from a variety of different newspapers or all from the same one. And then we have two important concepts that we covered in observation, time sampling and event. If the medium is live, like watching a TV show or an advert or a radio show, should you just count every time a particular word is used or behavior expressed, or should you have an interval of say 30 seconds and if the event occurs after that 30 seconds you record it and if it doesn't you don't. There are good reasons for using both techniques. The other thing you have to take into account is coding the data. In some ways this is the most important thing. If you do this incorrectly it means that behavior may fit in multiple categories so they need to be clear operationalized and they need to be exclusive. Behavior categories, if you remember from your observation at AS, are ways of identifying specific behaviors. These need to be objective, cover all possible component behaviors, making sure there's not a sort of waste basket that other you know, uncategorizable behaviors fall into, and they should be mutually exclusive. If I'm looking at aggression amongst children, one of my behavior categories might be hit. 
But I should be very clear if I have a second category for push, what constitutes a hit and what constitutes a push. And I should not be categorizing or mixing those behaviors up. This is why behavior categories are so important. Methods for representing the data. There are two approaches. We can take a quantitative, counting the number of occurrences, or we can describe the behavior in more detail. You know, Johnny struck um, Lucy uh, ferociously or whatever, and repeatedly. Now, another type of content analysis, which is less quantifiable, as it were, is what we call thematic analysis. Sometimes it's just not appropriate to do a quantitative analysis. Uh, in art, for example, looking at themes from a particular artist or in novels, counting the number of aggressive words isn't always that useful. So a theme is an idea, implicit or explicit, that reoccurs in the medium being investigated. Reoccurring themes may be complex. Uh, imagine, for example, the effect of immigration on the NHS if you're picking these out of newspapers just trying to look for the word immigration and nhs is not going to tell you much however looking for general themes will tell you how these newspapers um, view immigration and its impact whether it's positive negative and the nuance there is positive because immigrants work for the nhs is negative because immigrants may use the nhs that would be the sort of nuance you might see in a paper. Um, these can then be placed in broader categories, e.g. stereotyping of immigrants. And once the researchers identified the themes and categories, instances can be counted. Um, testing the validity of thematic analysis uh, is crucial. Once the thematic analysis has been conducted, categories developed from it can then be used to analyze a new set of data and if they fit so you've developed these categories on your first set of data if you then try and apply them to a second and they seem to fit this increases the validity of those categories of those themes uh, specifically and the second study then becomes quantitative so the first one is very much identifying these themes one might be stereotyping immigrants and then when you apply this to a second study you're just counting the number of occurrences. More on thematic analysis, it's a very lengthy process requiring the researcher to iteratively and that means repeatedly consider every item to ensure the data are gone through repeatedly. Um, the main purpose is to impose order on the data, ensure order represents the perceptions of the participant, Ensure order is emergent, i.e. you're not imposing yours on it, your ideas on it, you're actually identifying themes that are emerging from the material. And to reduce the data to meaningful but manageable size. Um, one of the things as well is to identify um, themes and be able to draw general conclusions that you can then apply to the medium as a whole. Here is an example of content analysis. I'm not going to take you through it right now, but have a look in your own time. It's well worth it. Here's an example of content analysis, and we'll be using something very similar in class. So in class, we're going to carry out content analysis on children's text, and we're going to look at gender stereotyping. Well, one of the first things you might do is identify key uh, masculine and traditional feminine traits that you would expect characters to be stereotyped as. So the male should be dominant, if our hypothesis is correct, insensitive, competitive, active, whereas the female should be emotional and receptive and intuitive. You can carry out a pre-study um, um, content analysis tonight to switch on the telly for 30 minutes or so. Have a watch of a few adverts. How, is the, how are the female characters portrayed? Uh, do they fit these stereotypes? Do they flip them um, arbitrarily or artificially? Some examples of thematic analysis, where you might use it. 
Um, if you want to analyse common themes of Soviet propaganda, for example, you might view a series of randomly selected or deliberately selected Soviet posters. Themes may emerge. I mean, look at this, you know, the, the Russian worker. Look how strong and powerful he is and how honest and good he looks. And look how creepy the, um, the internationalist, the globalist looks. You know, you try to buy him off with... Uh, what appears to be eggs mm. but you get the thing you know the the Russian is powerful he's tall he's strong there's something noble about the worker um, you could then develop these into categories that could be used later on content analysis ecological validity then so now we're getting into the evaluation i've broken this down into a sort of pee format for you a strength of the method is that it tends to have high ecological validity this is because it's based on observations of real behavior such as news this means that the research can be generalized and tends to have this high external validity now this is uh, not always true of observations, but in this case, we are dealing with what people produce, um, and that tells us something about those individuals. Now, what you have to just be a bit careful about here is that sometimes people produce artifacts that are satirical or deliberately uh, designed to obfuscate their particular views. So you are relying on the honesty to some extent of the producer and the savviness of the observer if you don't realize that it's satire for example content analysis replicability so one of the real strengths of content analysis is that actually you can replicate it uh, you and I can carry out content analysis as can anyone else um, I showed you there are newspaper articles about the Titanic and um, in archives you can get access to materials that are long uh, l or long ago were, were produced this means that we can look back we can uh, reproduce content analysis to find out um, whether or not our initial analysis was actually correct Kahneman who you come across in um, psychology and the economy um, argues that replication is absolutely key for psychology and actually many, many psychologists uh, and psychological research isn't uh, replicable. Have a look at this Economist um, article here that just shows you how bad the problem is in psychology. Observer bias is my absolutely favorite issue in this particular section. You are still dealing with people and people come to the table with a variety of biases, one of which is um, this particular particular picture, which always um, makes me think. When its owner was asked about it, it won the ugliest dog competition. But when its owner was asked about this dog, he said that it was adorable. Um, obviously, the owner is seeing something that I'm not, but that's because the owner's biased. You know, your parents may have said things like "you're the most beautiful child" or whatever. Um, maybe you are, uh, but uh, it's unlikely. Your parents are biased in that particular case, as are we all. I think my daughters are the most beautiful creatures on the earth. Um, that is my bias, and I'm aware of it. But sometimes observers are not aware, and people who carry out content analysis are not necessarily aware of their own bias. Cultural bias as well is an issue. Uh, much of the content analysis carried out on artifacts that really can only be understood in that cultural context. If you think about um, some of the difficulties we've had with uh, radical Islam, and I'm thinking specifically of the Drawing Muhammad cartoons, one of the main problems has been a cultural uh, misinterpretation. So in strict Islamic countries, it is forbidden to draw the prophet it is considered a high act of, of um, blasphemy to do so but in the west drawing satirical pictures of religious figures has been going on for for decades if not centuries 
and it's our way of poking fun at what we see as institutions that take themselves too seriously. You need to understand cultural artifacts in their context. Okay, so improvement. We can improve content analysis using inter-rater reliability. Two people independently observe behavior, i.e. they both carry out content analysis. They then carry out a correlation between their, their rating. And if the correlation is strong and positive, and that means that the two observers who have carried out this content analysis have increased its validity, they've increased its reliability. Ethics. Um, because you're dealing with artifacts that are usually public and published in the public domain, you do not necessarily have to worry about many of the um, ethical issues that are usually associated with research. So if I'm an artist and I make a painting or I produce a painting and I publish it online, I am implicitly consenting for people to analyze that and look at it. That is part of my um, implicit understanding of publishing it. And therefore you don't have to worry about informed consent and things like that. Having said that, there are still ethical issues. If for example you were analyzing um, controversial materials, um, you know, for example, racist rhetoric in newspapers, you would have to be careful because the implication might be from your study that you are somehow portraying individuals as holding views that they may well not hold. So you could damn an entire newspaper or cast aspergents on their um, on their good names. So an overview then. Content analysis is an indirect observation. We select our medium we decide what sample we're going to use, develop our categories, and count the number of occurrences. Coding is crucial, and how we represent the data is fundamental. Another type of content analysis is thematic. It's much more qualitative. We have to um, iteratively identify themes, um, and we can then apply these themes to a new set of data and that will increase the validity of our thematic analysis. The content analysis has high ecological validity, is replicated, suffers from observer bias, so cultural bias, and can be time consuming. Some studies that looked at content analysis, such as McCulloch, gender stereotyping in TV shows and Matthews, toilet humor, um, are good examples of how this has been used. Further evaluation, tends to be more ethical, can be improved using multiple observers. If you were asked to um, answer questions on this in any detail, you might get a four to sort of six marker. You would explain what it is and the limitations of it. Most likely you'd be asked to apply it. So that is the end of the content section of these PowerPoints. What I always suggest is at the end I have a, an exam style question which I'll take you through. If you're happy you understand content analysis, you do not want to take part in this exam section, uh, you are welcome to switch off. I think it'd be crazy to do so, but you are absolutely welcome. So content analysis exam style question. What are they actually going to ask you? Describe what is meant by content analysis. Two marks, very easy. We're just going to copy and paste almost our... Um, our definition in there and we might include an example just to really make sure we're getting the AO1 marks. Following previous research indicating the social benefits of green space in urban areas, two psycho psychology students decided to observe social behaviour in public spaces. They focused on neighbouring towns, Greensville, Woodmost, blah 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 blah. You can read this. Students compared the instances of considerate behaviours in the two towns. Uh, this is a question about behaviour categories. So it's not necessarily directly related in the STEM, but once you get down here, here's where you realize it's about content analysis. They record interviews. So here's your medium, interviews recorded. Students could develop their interview findings by carrying out content analysis and why content analysis would be appropriate. Well, 
The students can use content analysis as the recordings of the interviews can be considered media, i.e. the interviews are media because they've been recorded. Students will need to identify ideas, concepts present in the recordings, these are behaviour categories. They would then develop a series of categories and each time the interview uh, mentions something relevant to the category, they would tally. So we've got a three part answer. Why, you, why it's appropriate, what they would have to do, and a bit more detail on that. Explain how observer bias might influence the findings of content analysis. Firstly, when developing the behavior categories, the researcher may interpret categories in a biased way. So if I'm looking for a behavior, I may well shape my behavior categories to make finding that behavior more um, easy. I mean, take the Twitter guys, uh, Demos, who were looking for, they were looking for misogyny online. And that's never a good idea, really, when you're carrying out research. But they shape their behavior categories, and that's why the findings were interesting, because they decided misogyny was the use of those two words. Um, once the categories are developed, the observer may wrongfully place behaviors in appropriate categories because they want to shape the outcome. And a good example might be sarcastic nature. Um, you may know um, students of color who use the n-word and they are not using it often in a derogatory manner it's actually as a sort of sarcastic reclamation of the word uh, therefore but an algorithm might pick that word up and just start labeling young black guys as being racist which wouldn't make sense and that's pretty much it for content analysis if you have any questions, um, let me know, email me, and otherwise I will see you next time. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.